Hi and welcome to another episode of the National Science Week documentary series From Research to Reality. I'm Jeff Garrett, Queensland Chief Scientist. Last week we looked at some of the tools and technologies that the Queensland Police Forensic Services branch is using in the field and the lab to help detectives to determine what has happened at a crime scene. This week the forensics team helped to close the case. Let's take a look. The forensics teams believe that they've identified and collected all the evidence. Some has already been transmitted to the laboratory using systems developed by Queensland Police, so it's now time to see how it is processed at the Police Forensics and the Queensland Health Laboratories. We've just heard that the victim died in hospital, so this case is now officially a homicide. I'm here at Queensland Police Headquarters in Brisbane, where the specialist forensics teams are preparing to process the evidence in the labs and turn it into useful intelligence for the detectives to use. Hopefully, this evidence will help them solve this crime and stop the perpetrator from reoffending. I'm off to the Fingerprints Bureau first to see if we can come up with a match to the fingerprint found on the window. I'm here with Sergeant McCarthy, who's a fingerprints expert. Duncan, can you tell us how the samples are processed when they come into the Bureau? Yes, Kimberly. We receive fingerprints both from crime scenes and from watch houses. Sergeant Watling is checking off a dossier or a file on the, uh, from the live scan system. A person or a police officer at a watch house has captured a person's fingerprints on the live scan device. Demographic data is also added to those prints and once those um, images are correctly captured they are simultaneously uh, sent to the National Automated Fingerprint Identification Database in Canberra and then hard copy form is also sent here to the Fingerprint Bureau which prints out and we can have results in near real time uh, for those investigators sometimes with turnaround time within 15 to 20 minutes uh, informing them of the correct identity of the person that they have in custody and also initia initiating uh, other unsolved crime searches on the database to provide further information for those investigators. By taking mobile data into the field we're able to record in real time um, our activities and also get responses to uh, impression evidence that we may find. We can also collaborate with other forensic practitioners no matter where the crime occurs in Queensland um, and computing technology obviously is ever evolving um, the machines are becoming faster and with more processor performance means that we can achieve more things at the scene of the crime as opposed to back at the lab. These cabinets are one of our development techniques that we use to develop fingerprints on items uh, using superglue heated till it turns into a vapour and that vapour adheres to fingerprints on items. Damien's weighing the foil tray, which will contain the superglue. We don't want to have too much superglue in there, otherwise the superglue will adhere to other parts of the, the item, as well as the fingerprints, and we won't be able to visualise the prints as clearly as we would like. Damien's now placing a test strip, a piece of plastic with some test fingerprints on it, and those um, essentially are known control fingerprints, so we know there's fingerprints on that surface. This particular item will be, uh, it's finished its examination cycles within approximately 40 minutes. So from that point, we'll conduct our visual examinations. We'll record any latent prints, uh, if there are any present, which may take an additional 15 to 20 minutes. So in approximate times, hopefully we'll have some identifiable prints within an hour of um, commencing our physical examination here. We're back at the fingerprint bureau where the screwdriver has been in the superglue cabinet for about 30 minutes. Senior Sergeant Condolian is going to take us through the next steps. In this particular case, um, I've been advised that the fingerprint on the screwdriver is unidentifiable. There are not a sufficient number of characteristics for a fingerprint expert to make a determination as to the identity of that particular fingerprint. The fingerprint computer has provided us with a list of candidates of who it could possibly be. There is one particularly strong candidate and what we'll now do is get our fingerprint officers here at the Fingerprint Bureau to, to compare the, the fingerprints that, and make a determination as to whether they are identical or not. So this is the final step in the verification process. Can you tell us what the outcome is? Uh, yes, I can. I, I can concur with the, um, with the decision made by the two previous fingerprint experts that this 
particular fingerprint is identical as belonging to the complainant of the residence. If we have a record of that individual, uh, we can identify the individual. Often, uh, the person may not have been previously arrested or their record may not exist somewhere in another state or internationally. Uh, in those circumstances, we're able to know that it is a common person by the fact that they have the same DNA profile found at multiple scenes, and we're able to link those scenes together. Equally with fingerprints, the same is true. We can identify that the, that the fingerprint has come from the same individual, however, we don't know who that individual is. This can have huge intelligence value uh, to our operational policing areas. We're able to forensically show them how multiple crimes are linked together, and they're certainly going to be based on geographical locations and periods of time. Uh, that information is invaluable to them when they're investigating the crime and they're trying to narrow down their suspect pool. OK, once we've received the tool and the cast of the marks left at the scene, it's uh, up to us to compare the tool to the marks recovered from the crime scene. And the best way for us to do that is make our own test marks with the tool and make a cast so that we can do a direct comparison between the test mark cast and the cast received from the crime scene. So once you're satisfied that you've created enough test marks, it's time to cast those with Microsil, which is a forensic casting agent, and that'll allow us to capture the detail left behind by the tool in the substrate, and we can compare those marks to the marks recovered from the crime scene. Once the material sets, I'm then ready to take this cast of the test marks that I've made and compare it to the cast provided by the scenes of crime officer who's cast the marks left at the scene. On the left here we have the cast uh, collected at the scene by the scenes of crime officer and on the right we have the cast of the test marks that we made earlier. I'll examine the casts side by side under the microscope. Uh, this comparison microscope allows me to visualise both images at once, side by side, which allows me to compare the similarities or differences that uh, the cast may have. Uh, this microscope is also connected to a digital camera, and this digital camera feeds to a computer over here, which has software which allows us to capture what I'm seeing through the microscope. So at the moment, I've visualised a mark amongst the series of marks uh, we made on our test material and cast that is showing similar characteristics to the mark that we've recovered from the crime scene. And if I compare these under the microscope, I'm seeing significant agreement between the two marks, which leads me to the opinion that what we're seeing at the crime scene is the same mark that we've seen in our test marks, which would indicate that our tool was the same tool. Can you tell me the proportion and significance of using tool marks in the analysis of a crime scene? They probably don't appear at a significant number of crime scenes, but they're certainly a consideration at all crime scenes. Uh, obviously, people in the general public are aware now of shows like CSI and what the uh, forensic field has to offer to courts of law and police services, but tool marks is probably something that's not uh, highly represented in a lot of the television shows and movies that you see but it is a consideration at all crime scenes and it's a very very valuable piece of evidence if it can be located because we can provide a distinct link between a tool and the crime scene and providing links between offenders and objects used in the commission of a crime is pretty much what forensics is all about.